So let's start with some context for everybody here. What exactly is Fano NCW? Um, and what do they do? Well, that's a, a difficult question. Now, um, uh, Fano NCW is the Confederation of Netherlands Industry and Employers. So we represent the Dutch business community. Uh, we represent uh, ninety. We pre represent ninety percent of uh, of the Dutch private employment. So we are a large entrepreneurs and employers um, confederation. And what exactly does this representation involve? Oh, represent that 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 involves um, that you are um, talking a lot to to media, to press, to uh, politicians, to. Uh, to our ministers, room for discussion, and... uh, to <laughs> being <laughs> being on podiums like this, uh, and it's of course uh, first. Um, it's all about um, doing the right things for the Netherlands, for our country, and then of course also uh, we represent the interest of uh, of business. And uh, you say ninety percent of the private sector. Those other ten percent. What what are their reasons for not? Oh well. Yeah, well, there are not, of course, there are no good reasons. <laughs> uh, well, some of them, uh, we have a sister organization, uh, MKB Nederland. Um, so 90% of our members is uh, small and medium enterprises, but there's also um, a separate organization for uh, small or medium enterprises. So uh, that's that's MKB Nederland. So they also represent a uh, oh, percentage yeah. and... Um, well, some of them uh, choose not to be represented, but I call them free riders because what I what we achieve uh, for the members, well, yeah. they they go on with it, huh? They could, okay. yeah. Okay. Now, all swaths of the population uh, go through life without ever knowing what Peno NCW is. Or yeah, was. I understand. Uh, <laughs> so we were wondering. <laughs> it was. <laughs> it is not that since a ch since a, since childhood I. Had the ambition of becoming a product. Yeah, that, well, but, you know, <laughs> we, 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 yeah. we will get to, uh, to to that in a second. But we were wondering, uh, what was the first time you heard about the organization? Oh wow! Um, poof! I do not really have an idea. I think I I I think. I it was quite early that I was already aware because um, well, I studied law. Uh, and I've always been interested in politics. Yeah. Um, so, and then, for example, you know, in the Netherlands that we have the polder model. So we, yeah. especially uh, within the Social Economic Council, we yeah. we try to, but together with the trade unions and um, and employers uh, and scientists, we try to to find answers uh, for or for big questions for the Netherlands. So, and that is quite unique in the world and it's also uh, very relevant. Um, and so, well, uh, on the employer side, VNO is, uh, is well, the, you could say, uh, the chair of the employer's delegation. So that would have been... So then I, I think I heard about, I, I knew what it was, I guess, uh, when I studied at and university. You mentioned the, so you've mentioned representation and all of these different uh, roles that you have to play. What does your job as chair entail in that representation and in Fano and CW in general? Yes, well, um, my role is, um, of course, well, to have uh, the contacts with uh, with our members, yeah. with, with all the businesses. So, for example, on Friday, I always um, go to visit uh, to visit companies, so either very large or, or very small, um, and of course. Uh, I, I have a lot of talks with uh, politicians and with ministers, or and sometimes it's it's negotiations. I have a lot of uh, contacts also, of course, with trade unions. Um, well, in, in quite some um, quite some press uh, also. Which company will you visit on Friday? Oh, I don't know by heart. Oh, yes, I know. I, I'm uh, sorry. I will be uh, abroad, so this Friday I will be not. Oh, will not okay. Uh, okay. be in uh, yeah. at the company. Uh, Fortunately, yeah. but I will be traveling. We we will be on trade mission, and that means that together with uh, our minister of uh, foreign trade, uh, we take the companies. We take a lot of companies um, from the Netherlands, and we go to to South Korea and Japan. And you say I negotiate as well for Veno NCW. 
uh, what is the leverage you have during those negotiations? Yeah, that's a, that's a very, very good question. Um, it is, in fact, just that um, that the other side at the, of the table, at the, at the other side of the table, they know that you represent the business community. Mm. Um, so, well, and of course, like politicians, if they want, they can do what they want. But, um, well, it's at least it is, uh, uh, well, wise to listen also to the voice of the business. And you mentioned that it's important that they know that you represent businesses. How do you, what does that exactly mean to you? And how do you make them know that? Is it implied by your title or are there some... Yeah. yeah, so everybody everybody in The Hague knows what Vero is and, and okay. yeah, that's, uh, and, and who the chair is, so what you are representing. Is there a crisis at the ministry when you put out a press release, Vero NCW isn't being heard? Yeah, they wouldn't like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so no, we can mobilize quite some quite some press. That's uh, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. But okay. I think when you have a, a role like VNO and CEW and, and like me as a chair, so you have a lot of influence um, in the Netherlands. So that also comes with responsibility. So, yes. well, um, I don't like <laughs> being... Um, vocal in the press about things that we do not like so yeah i try to avoid it we'll get to that in a minute but maybe for yes to your personal and then building off of you mentioned working in, uh, in certain sectors so in your cv you've gone through many different things you started in ns and then to aliander was it always your goal to serve the common good um Yes, I think that really suits me by uh, by nature. I wouldn't say that it was really a goal, uh, but it it's yeah. I think uh, it really suits me. Okay, how come? Yeah, it, I think it's both nature and nurture. So <laughs> it's it's nature that you want to contribute to the common good, mm. um, and it's also nurture. I, I was raised in a, a, well, a very very. Uh, religious protestant christian um so i was teached by my parents that you have to um to use your talents uh, for society and now going back to this what does the common good mean for you as a representative of business interests well the common good and maybe that um that is also a bridge to to the new policy that we set, new strategy that we set um, after I took uh, took over the the presidency, is that we said we are here as a business not only for the economy mm. but for uh, to to create broad welfare mm -hmm. for the whole of the Netherlands for all people in the Netherlands. So that's also uh, with focus on in inclu inclusiveness and uh, sustainability. Maybe you mentioned before eh, that, that you didn't dream of being the chair of you know, uh, NCW. Uh, so you studied law in Utrecht. Um, what did you dream about? Oh, well, I, I've never had some kind of an ambition. Uh, so when I grow up, I want to be this or that, or um, uh, just, but I, like, I think like a lot of students after graduating, I just wanted a job. Yeah. <laughs> It was not uh, as it is now that, that uh, the labor market was tight, not at all. So you were happy to get a job. Mm. Um, I did not want to become a lawyer or a judge. So but you, you, you mentioned that you were interested in politics, for, for example. So did, did you, for example, from Mark Rutte, we know that we, in the back of the bus on the school trip, he was practicing interviews with his back <laughs> and as a prime minister. Yeah. So did you did you also like like uh, uh, think about politics as a career? Did you think no. I, I, I want to, you know, make a name for myself or no. or no. if if I get involved the, the Netherlands will be better where, <laughs> where 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 did it start? Because you, you don't end up on accident as as chair of Feno in Oh no well Mark Rutte is really unique, huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think he knew that he wanted to be a prime minister when he was four years old or something. <laughs> so, uh, and then everything was focused on on getting there. It's really amazing. Um, so no, no, for me. So I did not know what to study. Um, so then I choose to study law, which was okay, uh, but not the love of my life. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. okay, I just decided. Oh, I will get my degree, and then then we'll see. So. Um, 
the labor market was tight, it was not easy to find a job, so you were happy when you got a job. And um, then I think my whole career was just every time I, I got, well, I got promoted because, I, well, I was doing a good job, but yeah. I think what suits me and is that I, I always, I'm always uh, feeling responsible for the, uh, well, for the greater good, so always for the next level. So never only for my own piece of the puzzle. Well, you, you always lose. Always thinking about, okay, but there's more to it. So, um, I, and then I think, well, when it comes uh, in, a, in a larger company like uh, Dutch Railways, when it comes to uh, management development that is recognized and then, well, they... they and, we, and, and building on this as well, was there ever a moment when you got to the top of any of these companies and you realized, okay, wow, I'm at the top. And was there a moment when you were in, like reached the top of Bay and CW, when you really realized how much influence you could wield? No, no, uh, to be honest, I don't, I don't think I ever, uh, and maybe that's a bit female, uh, but I don't think I, it ever, um, uh, occurred to me. No, okay. no, okay. I'm still, uh, usually quite, quite impressed myself that, uh, how I'm treated because of my role, that I'm just Ingrid. I'm not a different, different Ingrid than 10 years ago or 20 years ago, <laughs> but, uh, uh, that's a strange thing. Yeah. yeah. And do, do we have the feeling that, that at Veno NCW, you can influence policy more than, for example, if you would be in parliament? Oh, that's a difficult question. Um, well, what I. So, of course, politicians have a more direct influence, um, but it's also very short time focused, uh, short term focused. And what what I like about working at uh, VNO is we are always working with um, with the agenda for the longer term. Mm. 2030, for example. For example, 2030, 2050. Um, yeah, so we're always thinking ahead, um, and I like that because it's also I want to contribute to solving the big issues of our time. Yeah. And you, you know, they are all they are all long term. Yeah, we have to act now, but they are all long term, and you have to have this long term focus. Yeah, and you mentioned that's difficult in politics. You see that every day. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. elections are. Uh, yeah, it's something in the press, week, yeah? you, they ask questions in parliament and they're all distracted by those questions and it's really not really interesting topic, but... but <laughs> yeah, but yeah. going back to direct influence, uh, politicians obviously are elected and they wield influence directly from those uh, representatives. So then why should you, as a representative of businesses, have as much power or a different type of power as a representative? Uh, they do have the power, of course. At the end of the day, they they decide. Um, and what I think is a duty for politicians is uh, to listen to uh, to all the stakeholders in society, uh, so to trade unions, to NGOs, and also to to business. And they need that to come to the right decisions and to come to the the the, the right policies. So they should listen to all parties. Okay. Um, then we, we move on, I think, um, because Peno NCW is of course, um, considered one of the most influential lobbying, um, uh, parties in the Netherlands. And, uh, we were wondering, how do you decide what you will lobby for? Oh, that's also a very good question. And it's quite difficult, uh, also because, uh, I think we are working on about tw 200. So hundreds. Wow. Uh, at, well, yeah. At the, at, at the same time, uh, always, um, and that it, is that even possible to like, you know, keep trying to do it, uh, do it, don't do it all by myself. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 200 goals at the same time. That's, that's like, do, do, do they close each other out? Like uh, one, number one, number 200. No, maybe? no, but it's just extremely, uh, diff different. So it can be about custom procedures, about pensions, about labor markets, mm. about, uh, of course, uh, energy transition, which is very high on our agenda. 
uh, about circularity, uh, well, you you name it. <laughs> um, um, so we have specialists who are all covering uh, the topics. Mm. Um, and I try, but that is quite, that, that it is difficult. I try to have uh, a few focus areas for, for myself. Yeah. Um, and of course, I try to decide what they are, um, well, reasoning from what is the most relevant for yeah. for the Netherlands and uh, and businesses. But but w- which parameters do you use when deciding when if something is relevant? Um, well, it's not that uh, mathematical. Let's okay. <laughs> you, 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 you but go just sometimes we you also have, of course, to uh, so on the one hand you are working on your own more long-term agenda. Uh, mm. For example, sustainability, energy transition is very important for us. So we have to speed it up. So we try to help. We try to help politicians and government in what they should do to speed it to speed it up. But then, then again, there's also, of course, sometimes uh, issues that are very, very relevant for business and that are here and now, and then I have to act. Yeah, <laughs> sure. <enough. laughs> yeah. So that's the agenda that uh, that our parliament sets, um, and we have to react, of course, also on that. Yeah. And how do you balance reactions that some of your stakeholders might have with the decisions governments might make from the negotiation process? Yeah, you mean that 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 uh, that my members can differ what they in yeah. their opinions? Yes. yes. Um, uh, yeah, that can be quite a challenge. And so, so many businesses, uh, so many different businesses, uh, so so many people, so many um, opinions. Mm. Um, but we usually manage to to find um, the opinion mm. that that's well. All of our members say, well, they, we we agree with that. Are you able to lobby, for example? Eh? I'm a company who makes literally. Um, the boxes where the oil goes in mm-hmm. eh, for Shell, for example. And, I, and I'm, I'm a big employer. I have 10,000 people who make all these boxes. Um, and then you have in your Vision 2030 agenda, like climate goals, mm-hmm. no oil. Um, am I still welcome at Veno NCB? Or are you then also designing like, okay, this will be our goal. And whether this company likes it or not, we are going to lobby for it. Because with your lobbying, also sometimes people go out of business or get hurt by the lobbies you do. Yeah, I think um, that our role is uh, to to mirror uh, to our members, the ones that are not that fast on, on for example, circularity or energy transition, hmm. to mirror them where they should go and to, um, to help uh, getting the policies set that make the conditions right for business um, to uh, to transform to sustainable business, uh, I think that that is the real challenge. And how exactly do you do that? Uh, well, of course, we are specialists, and uh, well, it's also a topic that is close to my own heart and and my my knowledge. Um, so our specialists, of course, they do the um, the uh, they do deep dives uh, with with our members with with the companies, and so then of course we then well discover uh, which condition conditions should be uh, put in place um, so what we would be should be lobbying for for example uh, when it comes to, to to the climate goals and energy transition uh, almost every company uh, which, which is not really known but almost every company does have a plan uh, to the... be carbon neutral mm. um, but uh, in many cases, um, they are not able to get a permit, for example, mm. or for all kinds of reasons. And getting a permit in the Netherlands uh, for infrastructure or for building for building your your sustainable plant or um, could take you, in on average, it takes you eight years. Mm. So one of the things that um, have you ever thought about why that is? Yeah, like, I know why it is. How is it possible that yeah. in such a developed, rich efficient country in in many ways well we are not that efficient well <laughs> I, I i would say that uh, we maybe relatively we still are yeah yeah i mean, <laughs> I mean there, there are countries in the world where they would wish that something would get yeah. done in nine years uh, yeah. but have you ever thought about the root causes of yeah yeah because when you um when you add up 
al die, um, uh, al die, al die, um, how do I put this? Uh, so, so you can, when you don't agree with mm. the permit, uh, then of course you can first complain uh, with your yeah. municipality and then we'll go at the end of the day to the highest uh, judge, highest court. Uh, but when you, when you add up all the weeks that are uh, in the law, which sh should be there for these procedures, uh, like a municipality has to decide in six weeks. Yeah, yeah. We when you add it all up, it takes you to, uh, uh, at, at the end of the our Raad van State, uh, the, our judge, uh, takes one year. Yeah, okay. so, so already but there. The, so the problem is that it's all, uh, it, it's just, there are not eno enough civil s civil servants. There are not e enough judges. There's yeah. no. Yeah. So so if I want to help businesses, I should go and be a judge. Yes, but I th yes that that would that would help. <laughs> uh, well, if you study law, of course. But uh, <laughs> you didn't. Did you? No, 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 not. no. I'm going but to get to Germany in a in a second. But uh, <laughs> um, uh, there would, um, but did, 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 I mean, did, did yeah, no, but, but I, w I think I think. It has to be. There has to be a more fundamental transformation. Yeah. Um, Should people have fewer things. rights to to complain? Well, this might be uh, an option. So it was in one of the newspapers also a couple of weeks ago that that our judges are also overloaded mm. with all kinds of well, to put it uh, blunt, nitty gritty, um, nitty gritty decisions that they have. Uh, that they have to make. Well, they, we should not do that. So we are, we are not that efficient as a uh, as a country. What do you think it would take for you to become more efficient? So well, the, I think, like 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 for this permitting um, procedure, should be eased. Uh, maybe it it should be more difficult to do some some nitty gritty. Yeah. Uh, issues which are just meant for filibustering. So, for example, people living in a house, this is this is a real-life example, living in a house, there's going to be built houses across the streets where now they have a, a clear view. Yeah. Uh, they can see the horizon. People don't want those houses there. And then they say, okay, but you cannot give the permit because of the nitrogen problem. Yeah. Um, so that's also a kind of misuse or abuse of, of law. When we when we look abroad for examples of countries who, who maybe uh, also have the same problem and are dealing with it, you can look at Germany. They they built, for example, a new Tesla fabric uh, yeah. in the neighborhood of Berlin. They bulldozed a very big forest without any procedures. Yeah. They then also squashed all the complaints that the water uh, of from the lake that was in the neighborhood and provided drinking water for inhabitants of Berlin uh, was also not a problem. So that was squashed as well. And the fabric was built uh, for German uh, standards in very, very limited amount of time. They were very proud of it. Chancellor Olaf Scholz went there and said, this is the new tempo, fortunately, mm -hmm. in, um, in Germany. Um, is that a model you, you, you would adv advocate for? Like Margaret mm -hmm. taking charge and saying, that it, new fabric uh, has to be built. No, I was just talking about the nitty gritty decisions. I, you sure not. Yeah. These are not nitty gritty decisions. So, uh, but they show how a government, when it wants, can be very fast. Yeah, but then I think, uh, like, like, uh, like now the European Commission is coming up, and it, this is part of the Green Deal, the Fit for Fifty Five uh, package. Um, they are coming up with a uh, kind of a uh, a principle that uh, projects who are needed for reaching the climate goals, which is, I think, the top one priority that we have as as, uh, as mankind compared to, to other issues, um, then that that if there if if a project is necessary for, for climate goals, so like for in energy transition, then it could override other interests, mm -hmm. uh, but it is limited really to projects uh, necessary for uh, for energy transition and which other interests would be overrided yeah well it can be well i, I think a very uh, a real dilemma uh, now is in for example the carbon storage mm. uh, carbon capture and storage ccs the pipes um that have to be built to for ccs in the netherlands 
So now um, that is absolutely uh, crucial for meeting uh, the Dutch climate goals, mm. uh, but it is stopped uh, now because there's some nitrogen emission when it's built. So, well, here I think you have the, the, the uh, an example of the dilemma um, and, and one of the yeah, examples also where you could imagine that, that there is an overriding principle that the project, project has to con continue. And who decides whether or not this, um, who decides on the principle being overriding? Um, I think I'm not, so this is, this is, uh, this, uh, law is still a proposal, but I'm not sure, but I, well, I assume that it will be government. Okay. And building from this into more of the Dutch context. So Shell and Unilever have decided to set up shop in other companies. Could you also delve into some of the repercussions this may have for the Dutch economy as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, so, so large multinational uh, companies um, are uh, extremely important. They are extremely important in the ecosystems. Um, so you could say the economic backbone of a country. So there are always ecosystems from this large company, big company with all uh, sorts of, of SMEs uh, working together. They are also uh, companies that uh, invest the most, of course, most money in research and, and development, which also has, of course, spin-offs, startups, scale-ups, so uh, new businesses. They are also, of course, um, uh, extremely important for, um, for creating uh, human talent. So um, they are magnets. Um, and well, you get a real good education in, in those extreme large companies. So for example, uh, when it comes to the energy business, um, a lot of, of people who work now in green energy in the Netherlands, they were educated, uh, at Shell and then one day they left Shell. Mm. So I was, for example, in a meeting about the energy transition, speeding it up a couple of weeks ago, and there were 15 people in the room and I think I was the only one who did not have a background at Shell. Really? So, wow, really? yeah, and we need that knowledge. Yeah. Uh, so same goes, of course, for Unilever, especially when it comes to food um, and the food transition. And so, yeah, well, when those companies leave your country, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's disruptive for the ecosystem. It's a big problem, mm. uh, but also uh, we, we said there, <laughs> well, though then in 10, 20 years, no. Where do we get the, the talents and is the expertise? It, is it is it maybe uh, a good example of three lobbies that didn't succeed? When such a big company leaves, do you take that personally as Veno and Sway like we failed? Um, no, no. Okay. It also it was before my time, so it's for me easy to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But I think yeah, it's a real. It, yeah, it, it's um. I think, th I think we as a country are think thinking too easy about uh, large companies leaving leaving our country. The effects, the effects of it, the downside effects. Also, for example, um, so I will be going on a trade mission mm. uh, later this week, and then what you see if you bring those large companies who are known in the world that yeah. opens doors yeah. so, so it's uh, easier for for the smes for example that you bring with you who want to do well in this case business with japan with korea it's much more easy uh, when they are accompanied by unilever or, or shell or dsm so shell and dsm they won't be attending friday uh no no probably not probably not well there are some of course historical ties still yeah so i'm not sure whether they will be there next week could be that a, a so a, a regional but you, you see them be there. you see them less often yeah hmm. yes we could, uh, yes of course yeah. they left yeah. and, and and have you have you seen any tangible uh, impacts on the dutch economy because uh, uh, it's too early it's too early we go in 10 years we've been year. 2023 is it 2033 yeah something like 2030 where they so they left the uh, last two to three years in 10 years then you will see because then also when when they are 
gone, they are also the Netherlands is not longer in their hearts. So that's not in the beginning, but mm. in due time, uh, it will. So then when it comes, for example, to investing in a new R&D center or uh. in a new, like, um, uh, new plant needed for the, for the food transition or for, for green energy, uh, they will think, well, where are we going to invest? But they won't yeah. think about the Netherlands. It's just not in their heart anymore. There are all their interests. We will be gone from the whole conversation. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Well, of course, the well, we will be. Uh, they will look at us as just any potential country to invest in. Yeah. So they will just compare, and it will not longer be at their core. Yeah, and that's the difference. Bu and building off of success and failure, uh, there are some parties who believe that. Shell leaving the Netherlands was a win. What would you say to those voices or to those critics? Yes, well, um, what shall I say about shall I say you, you, you seem even a bit. Do you get this question a lot? Uh, no, not that. No, 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 that mm -hmm. often. Not that often. No, that's one of the things that uh, that amazes me. Though. So now, the Spanish builders coming to the Netherlands, they say, and then. Uh, um, so then there's a lot of um, media attention to that. Mm. It's almost there, there. There's more media attention in Spain now for them leaving and here for, for them coming mm. than there was all about Le Shell, Unilever and DSM leaving. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> leaving the Netherlands, which really amazes me. Uh, you, 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 you saw it. You were like, there, there. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go again. Well, are you are you tired by by the fact that you have to defend why it's good that they are here or? Uh, no, it's just I think it's so. I'm looking for the for the right way to put it. It's just so. So disappointing, mm. that we seem to not longer see, the relevance of companies of of these kinds of companies and for example. Uh, Shell is the largest investor in green and clean energy in the Netherlands. We need their expertise. We need we need their their um, financial ability. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm yeah well I'm disappointed that we don't see it anymore. So in Spain they see it, mm -hmm. in the Netherlands we don't. And how would you respond to other critics who might say that their investment in clean energy and uh, those types of enterprises? could be characterized as greenwashing, as something which might seem like it contributing to environmental policies, but is really aiming to promote its business interest. How would you respond yeah. to that? Well, no company, no single company will invest billions of euros for greenwashing. They see, every, every company sees that that, that, is the, that that is the future. Um, so and I'm I'm really that that all those that that there's such a kind of a cancel culture also against uh, multinational company financial can cancel culture. Well, it's it's a f also see what's happening uh, in the de the debate about Heineken leaving Russia. Yeah, it's also well the, it's so so that really amazes me that um, it's it's so. It's so hostile, even. Mm. Why do you think that is? Well, yeah. <laughs> In terms of the cat Ooh, the is to blame, Mr. Steisen, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why it's so hostile, yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, I think there are, there are several, several reasons, I think, for example. Uh, it's the way, the, are you trans transparent? Huh? So how, how do you do your communications? Uh, but it is also, I think we are a bit spoiled, uh, so that we had like like we were discussing about nobody really caring about um, big companies leaving leaving our country. Mm -hmm. um, so that's also, I think that's also one of the the main problems. Um, yeah, and what is difficult to get across, you could say. And what that is at the core of our new policy since two years. Well, you take your uh, responsibility for society mm. as a company, either either uh, large or small. Um, 
So you should really do that, and but you should all also be transparent about it and get it get it across. And that is also difficult. What I what I experience uh, is that press is not really interested in in good news, in good news from from companies in in what is uh, what is happening. Yeah. When it comes to sustainability or transparency or. Yeah. Maybe it's a good time to move to uh, some questions from the audience. Um, yeah, uh, we have a microphone. It will come to you. You are very fast in second row. Uh, so we'll go to you first. Okay. Uh, so my question is as follows. Like, uh, there's always like reasons for companies to migrate, right? In the 60s, the shipping industry, for example, the shipbuilding industry, they left because of rising uh, welfare levels and rising wage levels. Uh, you know, like tax breaks. So, so a lot of reason why big companies were here but uh, we have to like finance our uh, welfare state somehow and taxes from companies is a big part of that. So as a person and as a representative of the, of the employers, where would you personally draw the line in saying like, hey, uh, we want this company in our country and where would you say like, okay, the policies we need to implement to keep a company here are too much and they would be detrimental to society to keep here. Where do you... Uh, both as an individual and as an uh, representative, draw the line. Yeah, the question implies like it would be a good idea to choose, to choose which uh, businesses and industries you want to have and which which you don't want to have or you don't mind if they go bankrupt or leave. Um, and I think um, I think that the right policy would be that that from the government perspective we set the right conditions about uh, for example um, environmental and labor labor conditions um and then within those um within those uh, conditions the best companies and the best entrepreneurs survive um and that is what made our country uh, big so um i think i think that is uh, that is the way the way forward and what i one of the main attention points or focus focus points for us at this moment, for example, is when it comes to setting the right conditions um, for businesses in the Netherlands, um, is for example, that we over-regulate. Um, we over-regulate and also when it comes to circular and sustainable business, um, we, we uh, are not able to adjust laws and regulations that hinder uh, this, this trend and this development to adjust them uh, quick. So what we now see is startups and scale ups uh, in, for example, biotech and all the in circular tech on the real new economy. Well, it, like in your question, the, the kind of companies you want to have, um, they leave um, because because of our regulation, because it's not fast enough, not quick enough that we ad adjust the rules and that's really really worrisome because that's just just the companies that you want to have in a new economy because it's all about for next generations for you for your children we both want to have a sustainable fully 100% sustainable economy but also we do want to have companies to earn money we still have to earn money both for ourselves for <laughs> for your own wallet but but also to provide for the public services like your your uh, police officers and your nurses and your teachers. Um, so I think it's the responsibility of my generation uh, to provide both sustainability and well the possibility to 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 earn the money that we need. Thank you. Next question. Uh, I think you were the second one I saw uh, when I answered. On the left, uh, Judah. Yep. Oh, sorry. Right. Thank you. Um, you were saying that, like, as a country, we came big, and we need all these companies in our own country, also to create like the new economy for the Netherlands. But what about all the other countries? Like, a just transition isn't just for us; it's also for other countries in the world. And if we are going again to like the old economy, that we need to be the first, or we need to be the best, and we don't, it almost feels like we don't want to. Not sharing, but like 
taking almost away from other countries. Like, how do you see a just transition if we're only speaking about ourselves and we need to be the ones to invent and we need to want to develop? Oh, how does it look? Yes, I, th I think we have an obligation to um, to take, especially in, in business to business relations, uh, businesses, companies, especially also smaller companies um, outside the European Union with us. Um, and also that we should, for example, I've been discussing that yesterday with the WTO and also the uh, ILO, the International Labour Organization, we have to try to, to get more investments, for example, to, to Africa. Um, so we have to take responsibility, not only for our own country. I absolutely agree. And I, I even think that we have a, uh, a moral obligation. We have so much money and we have so much knowledge. Um, that we should provide the solution that people and planet need uh, for the whole world. I think that's also um, a resp responsibility that our country has. Okay, thank you. We can have two more. Just down there at the back with the black coat. Um, so you talk about the need to include all stakeholders, like policy, uh, with within the government. Uh, but given the fact that over the last couple of years, labor unions have like massively lost members and thus also influence. To what do you view the welfare of employees also as your job to somewhat look after? So, um, so employers are responsible for their employees and they, they feel responsible is responsible for their employees and, and um well um what I see is that they take responsibility for their for their employees. Um um so well and especially a tight labor market, even if you wouldn't want to fish you will you will really have to. And then again about trade unions Although they have been losing members, of course, but they are gain, gaining now uh, members again, which is good. Um, they are still, I agree with, with the chair of FNV, the largest trade union in the Netherlands. Well, they are still with one million members. They're one of the most representative um, um, organizations um, with the voice of, well, citizens, of course, citizens, well, with work, but also without work. Um, well, that there are in the Netherlands, they are, I don't know, which is the largest political party when it comes to membership, but I think they they, they have maybe 50,000 or something. <laughs> uh, so they have all, FNV has almost 1 million. Uh, so they're, for me, they are still very representative and relevant. Okay. Any other questions right here up front? Thank you. Uh, to contribute on the point made by, of uh, FNV and also that you're being promoted as the most powerful lobbyist in the Netherlands. Um, and we also see that the large companies like Shell and DSM are moving to other countries. I'm wondering, is that still true? Are you the most powerful lobbyist in the Netherlands? <laughs> Oh, I don't know if it's uh, it's really compliments uh, when when you would be uh, when you would be called over when you are called uh, the most powerful. Well, um, I don't think any organization would be able to stop uh, a process like uh, like those companies uh, leaving. So, and it's not like a competition. Um, we we achieve a lot. Um, so, and that's good for the Netherlands and that's, that's good for business. Okay, thank you. Then we, um, I think that the problems are clear. Yeah? And um, uh, I think you, you also mentioned part of the solution. Yeah? So cutting down on bureau bureaucracy and, and uh, getting faster tracks for permits. Um, what are other uh, signals that make you hopeful? Do you see, for example, uh, you, you wrote a piece in the NRC uh, 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 outlining what you wanted to have done by the government to, you know, uh, get the things going again. Was there, for example, a positive reaction from the from the government to your piece? And are you, are they actually working on uh, what you think are good solutions? Yeah, so we are really worried about the investment climate in the Netherlands, and that is uh, 
and 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 that is because we are um, at a, a crucial point in history. We have to transform our economies uh, to sustainable economies, but also to high tech economies. Uh, and we still need to have industry because no. Europe and, and we play a role in it has to be more independent from countries uh, outside the EU. So we are at the brink of a, a very, very intense transformation and that will ask for tens of billions of euros investment in the Netherlands from private uh, companies. Um, so it has to be a, a country like the Netherlands. We have to be very attractive for those investments. Yeah. Yeah, and especially at this moment in in history. So, um, we have been really, really been the voice uh, voice of that. And um, and and how how is the reaction been? Because yeah, the re it is clear, but no. yeah. The, so the reaction is um, is positive, and our government and our uh, the ministers they really recognize what mm. has to be what has to be done. Yeah. Uh, but then then again, of course, for the Netherlands, uh, like. Um, uh, the 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 um the power of government to achieve things really yeah. in practice. So we see it with Groningen, we see it with the Toeslagen affair. Well, that is a problem. But that this, is, this is again a problem. I, 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 what my question is is where where does the solution lie? Where do you see chances for things actually changing? Well, what I do see is the good spirit to get it changed. So inside the government or inside, inside the government, in, yeah, inside inside government, inside uh, departments. So um, they are really looking looking into and looking uh, looking for the solutions. For example, on this permitting. So what we were discussing is the permitting, and then what the European Union is going to do about it. Mm. Um, we also see now, for example, in Europe that uh, they are coming up with an answer to uh, the um, Inflation Reduction Act in, in uh, the America. USA, yeah. which will draw companies uh, from Europe to the to the US. So, so the European Union is coming up with an answer. That's also so. That's also good. Um, so, of course, things are also going forward. But this good spirit you mentioned. Is that really enough to solve all of these problems that we've mentioned? What is the real incentive to drive everyone to make this change? Well, uh, I think without this spirit, you won't achieve anything. And um, um, especially our our coalition, uh, the ministers, the ministers that we have now, they really have an agenda. They want to solve it. It's their. It's what they are there for. So, for example, the extremely difficult nitrogen problem, they really want to solve it. There's a lot of money available to solve it. Yeah. Uh, so, of course, it is extremely complicated. But um, what I see now, and that is better than, than the years before this government, um, they are really uh, focused on solving it, also at the housing market, for example. Yeah. And, for example, if we look at Brabant, the region Brabant, they, are they leading the way in this? Because you have ASML, and uh, around that there seems to be an ecosystem which recovered faster from, for example, Corona and other crises. Um, you see a lot of investments there, uh, and you see some kind of new economy, I think, emerging. If you look at all the Netherlands, they, did they, yeah. is that something you draw inspiration from? Oh, absolutely. Brainport is an uh, is a, a extreme, extremely good example. Um, well, we have a very large multinational at the heart, ASML, yeah. and then it's they have this ecosystem with all kinds of other, also uh, very innovative, small and medium enterprises, which they work together very intensely. Um, and there's also the triple helix, um, so government, local government, yeah. uh, universities, MBO, yeah. um, and the companies working intensely together. Should that be the national model? Yes. Absolutely, and and it is, but um, but the evidence it is. goes wrong in north of Holland, south of Holland. What what, what are they? Yeah, there are there are uh, a couple of other um, ecosystems like that, like this, not that vibrant yet. But um, um, but but then again, it comes back to the point that we that it's 
usually a, a large company at the heart of it, mm -hmm. um, like ASML. Um, but it's also, for example, biotech is is Leiden, mm -hmm. uh, Leiden, Rotterdam, Delft. Uh, so there there are a couple, and it is it is ab absolutely the example of how we should build new ecosystems and and grow them. And and delving into this uh, helix that you mentioned, um, and that if there's a large company at the heart of it and other smaller parties around, how likely is it that when the conversation gets very serious and you have to draw the boundaries very strong, how likely is it that those other parties will be heard and that their interests will actually be put into practice? That what will be into... That their interests will be put into practice. Their issues will be put... put sorry, I don't understand the question. Um, when there is a large company and then smaller yeah. companies, yeah. smaller stakeholders, as you mentioned, universities, for example, when conversations get serious and strong boundaries have to be drawn, how likely is it that those smaller interests or smaller companies or smaller parties, how likely is it that those interests will be heard by those who have to take up more space in the conversation? Yeah, well, there is, yeah. Um, well, what I see, of course, um, uh, of course, it's always uh, you have to really, really ban balance. Uh, um, you have to what? Yeah, you have to really balance, okay. of course. Uh, and How do I you think, do that? Oh, I think that's that's one of the roles of government uh, to play an important role in that. And it's also, of course, a responsibility for the larger company, uh, which I see, for example, ASML really, really take on. Um, so, yeah, that's that's true. Um, Another another example of an ecosystem is, for example, Gemmenot in uh, in Limburg. Um, so there are also big. It's of course the the old mining complex that yeah. became DSM, and and now it's uh, a couple of companies, two large ones, Sabic and and OCI. And twenty five percent of the economy of Limburg is attached to this to this complex. Wow. And so. So now they have this whole plan how to become circular. There will be billions of investments from those companies and there's a lot of innovation also going on. So now uh, the challenge is that the government should help with getting the permits, should help with getting the, the infrastructure, uh, for example, for hydrogen. And, and so this, so these ecosystems, they have to, well, also now transform. And that's how you do it, triple helix. Mm. So. Um, uh, universities, MBOs, governments, but if we and companies, if we find ourselves in this situation now by using this same method, um, how likely do you think it is that we can actually solve the problem by trying to use the same tools? Do you think something different could be required? Well, but I'm still, um, I'm still wondering. What is there's something really in Brainport, for example, there's something really unique, and that is something to do. Maybe it's even because it's Brabant, and <laughs> um, no, really because yeah. they're so they 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 work in a sort in a, a special special way. They work together. Mm. Um, it's it's hard to explain. I'm still it's still puzzling me. What is it? What because there it's it's really flourishing extremely yeah the um, so collaborative mindset yeah collaborative mindset and and well cooperation helping each other uh having uh, i think also having a, a real goal together with the whole ecosystem where you want to go and that is good for society and it's it's good for your province um mm. it's something like that but it's really unique okay well, um, what does this i'm sorry but going back to the question what does this have to do with solving this same problem with the same tools are you suggesting that this could be something to lean into in terms of solving it or are you elaborating more on the problem no so this triple helix cooperation whatever you call it yeah a way of um working in ecosystems mm -hmm. um these are of course the solutions um so well and we see that it works on several places uh, in the Netherlands, for example, also also in the north. Um, 
Uh, but but you were asking, is there something unique? Uh, well, there is something unique there in Brainport. It's hard to explain what it is. Um, mm. So, and it has something to do with with well, how do you, how they cooperate? Huh. Yeah. Maybe to uh, round off the interview, I want to talk uh, shortly about something that's also unique. Uh, but then about you, you are the first uh, woman chair of PNO NCW. Uh, and if we look to the future, I think. We all hope you're you're not the last, and many more will go off. Uh, um, but you, you, uh, you, you talked in the interviews about uh, female qualities you bring to leadership positions, such as uh, listening to your feeling and working intuitively. Um, and I, I, I was wondering, what is the the biggest difference between a woman and men when it comes to the leadership and how they uh, practice it? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, that's a big question, huh? Um... And it's always a bit tricky question to answer because uh, every man and every uh, woman is is different. So you have men with female leadership qualities and 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 women without them. <laughs> mm. So, but but on average, um, yeah. Well, I think. Well, there is. I think there is also research. That shows that on on IQ you see that we are the same, <laughs> but on EQ, emotional mm. intelligence, well, on average, uh, women are are better, and I think I think this this is the this is the main difference. And going to the broader structural issue, would you say the issue lies primarily in representation and will organically solve itself, or do you think companies need to actively make an effort? to include more women in these spaces. Yeah, it's International Women's Day it today. Is. So uh, sure. um, so I, I was thinking about it today. Mm. And I, well, I, I was having, uh, having, uh, doing some apps with my, with friends and, uh, and colleagues as well. Um, and we're not at all, no, not at all there yet. Uh, so when it comes to to equal chances and uh, opportunities and um, uh, for for women, um, I think even maybe we are a bit deteri deteriorating. It, How so? Yeah, yeah. It, I'm I'm not that optimistic at this this moment in time. Well, when you look at the global level, uh, the United Nations said that last year we had the most conflicts uh, in the world since Second World War. And uh, uh, women are al always um, uh, the big. Um, we always suffer the most from uh, from conflicts. So that's on the global level, which is which is not okay. But then again, for example, today was in Financial Dagblad that eighty percent of the Dutch people think that twenty eight hours working is uh, enough for a mother of young children. Mm -hmm. I was rather disappointed about that. How many hours should it be? Whatever they decide, and I hope they decide it with their with their partner. Yeah. Mm. So, but that this it's so deep in the Dutch culture that the mother has to be with her children. Mm. Um, I did not expect that it would be eighty percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People giving that answer to 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 this question. So I was really disappointed about that. Um, well, and what you also, of course, uh, see these days is really uh, for for women who are really visible also in, in the press and social media is really hate um, just because they are female. Yeah. Um, is it, is it God with uh, angry armor uh, for, for example, things like for that. example, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so well, a day like today, then you then you really realize uh, that there is still so much work to do. And why do you keep going? Because there are many setbacks. Eh? Uh, companies leaving the the country, uh, oh. women wa wanting yeah. to to work less. Uh, I mean, the, the the signs are not, sometimes not promising, and you all have to take it in and deal with it. To uh, to, to maybe put it this way, in the last question, why do you? still keep going uh, and will tomorrow work again to change it? Yes, because I deeply care. I deeply care 
about society and I really want to to hand over the country to the next generation to you and to your children um really I really want want it to be sustainable to in, uh, inclusive but also that you can all earn earn your money so that you can have a decent uh, decent life and that your children my grandchildren <laughs> can have uh, can have a decent life here here in the Netherlands and uh, well of course my role is primarily uh, the Netherlands but I also really deeply care for our earth and all the people on our planet so um, and that is what really truly mot motivates me so that also keeps you going eh? thank you for that answer but that is all the time we have for today thank you so much for joining us, Ms. Tyson, and to the audience, Mr. thank you for coming. You're all doing very well. And please join us for our next interview on March 13th from 1 to 2 p.m. with former Vice President of UEFA, Michael van Praag. Uh, apart from that, uh, we would like to um, uh, say that uh, we have uh, at this moment uh, Werving, so you can apply to be in room for discussion. Uh, this will last for like one and a half week more, I think. So please make sure to apply on time. Um, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. Uh, and uh, I would ask you for a warm applause for Ingrid Tyson.